Welcome, everybody. And I'm not quite sure which uh, number we're on, and maybe fourth for this year for what's working and sharing our experiences of Gen AI. Um, I'd just like to make an acknowledgement for country. Uh, the University of Queensland acknowledges the traditional owners uh, on the lands on which we are meeting today. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue a cultural and spiritual connections to country. And we recognise their valuable contributions to Australia and global society. Um, uh, I'm going to pass it over to all. So for our agenda for today, we've got three presentations. Um, we've got Luke from uh, Italy, who's going to take you through uh, a, a, a workshop around how he is developing uh, the use of Gen AI in assessment. Uh, we've got Ali and we've got Hong, who's going to talk to you a little bit about uh, Gen AI in Turn It In. And then we've got a survey to complete at the end. Just reminding you that this uh, session is recorded uh, and we will share the, uh, the recording to everybody who has registered uh, and it will eventually find its way to our website. If you want to share your own experiences, um, there is a QR code there to the right uh, and you can uh, jump in on that one. We will also ask you to spend some time just um, talking a little bit about what if, what um, what happens in today's session and how what use it has been to you. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Dom, who's just going to run you through a quick update on Gen AI as we see it. Hi everyone, thanks for coming along. My name is Dom McGraw. I'm the Teaching and Learning Manager here within the Institute for Teaching and Learning Innovation. I too would like to acknowledge the country on which we are gathered. So generative AI has burst onto the scenes pretty much the end of November last year and has been changing pretty dramatically throughout this year. It's particularly a subset of artificial intelligence that leverages machine learning to generate data output from a given input. So the big difference is that you can create something new based on a whole heap of other things that already exist, um, from text to images to music to a whole heap more by giving an input to get things started. When, at the end of November, when things were kicking off in this way, there were a range of image tools and ChatGPT jumped onto the scene, changing the way text was used. Uh, this is a, a month or two ago now. Um, if I wanted to try and put all of these things, all of the tools that are out there in different systems onto a page, I think I would be getting to text size that would be far too small to read. But the key message from this is that there's this huge range of text-based tools, some of which are based on ChatGPT, some of which based on um, Google Bard, some of which are based on other underlying AI models. Um, then there's a whole heap of video tools that have now emerged, which are really interesting, image generation tools, code generation, speech, 3D, and a whole heap of other things that combine to generate a whole range of different topics or ideas and approaches that can be used um, in work, in study, in learning, um, some in really positive ways, some in ways which are a little bit scary. One of my favorite examples to play with, because I think it shows a whole heap of issues and opportunities as well as it's really fun is this AI art generation space. Um, this has raised a lot of controversies around how art is being used to generate the engines behind these things as well as giving opportunities for creating new types of arts and interesting things. Uh, my colleague Dr. Sankas Ravi generated that image with this bit of text uh, and I think it's kind of incredible that we can generate these sort of images with this sort of text nowadays. Um, and I think it gives us opportunities to add visuals, to explore ideas, to share with concepts in ways that weren't available for us before, as well as being able to bring to the front ideas around biases in text and in approaches and the way we think about occupations and a whole heap of things there. So it's an exciting area. Um, it gives opportunities, but also has a range of issues that we need to grapple with. ChatGPT is everyone's favorite. It's caused the most um, interest. It's an intelligent chat shot created by OpenAI. 
OpenAI was originally about being an open source and not-for-profit company. It changed to being a for-profit company, has worked very closely with Microsoft. Um, it offers a free plan, which is running ChatGPT 3.5, um, and a subscription plan, which runs four, um, which is a more sophisticated model. So it's interesting the way these areas are changing with both the free models as well as the paid for service models. And it's important to keep in mind that if you're trying things with the free models, that those subscriptions or paid plans may be able to produce far more powerful and interesting results. So some common applications of, in education for using these. And there are so many frameworks and ways of thinking about this. Here's one from Tory Trust, um, which I think is, is worth looking at. So you can do anything from writing a whole heap of different approaches and all of these generating ideas about things that you can make. And some of them are really useful for students to use. Some of them are really useful for you to use as academics or as learning designers or in other roles around teaching and learning. Some of my favorites, I love drafting rubrics with uh, generative AI. I think it's given some really interesting starts to what could have been a blank page otherwise and made me think about the way I'm writing things in slightly different ways. Um, I know, I can move on. So before I hand over to Luke, I think the last couple of things I want to say is that there are some incredible opportunities for us to get involved with and to explore. Uh, there's some people who are really passionate about this and it's giving opportunities to explore assessment and teaching and learning in new ways. Uh, there's opportunities to generate text, feedback, um, comments, much faster than we've generated before by partnering with AI to make these things happen. Um, opportunities to produce productivity. I think I've also seen opportunities to reduce productivity by playing with these things. Um, and these other options for enhancing student support mechanisms, bringing AI literacy into the curriculum. But alongside, there's a lot of, in a, a lot of challenges from how do we have to rethink assessment design, the unpredictable nature and inaccuracies is part of generative AI. And, some of the integration and changes to the systems that we have going are a really interesting and challenging space for us to grapple with. Oh, so I lost a slide that I thought was gonna be there. Uh, so I was gonna wrap up with just one more comment that we have been exploring ways of integrating this into different systems. One of the ones which is pushing edges is Ripple, which is run by Hassan. So if you'd like to play with Ripple, please feel free to reach out to Italy or to Hassan himself, and he'll be keen to look at ways where you can be using generative AI and other AI systems in Ripple, which can be used to generate questions with your students in to help them learn and for assessment. So I think I've hopefully given a bit of a background around where generative AI is. Um, if you have further questions in this space, feel free to reach out to me or any of the other speakers today. And I'm just gonna hit that button. Um, and Luke, if you're ready, I'm gonna hand over to you. Sure, thanks, Dom. Um, so, uh, I was just here listening to that big long list of uh, of things that that uh, we can do now with AI, and I was just I'm I'm still waiting for that that version of uh, of generative AI that's in Iron Man, you know, Jarvis, who uh, uh, who can be snarky to you and and just tell you when you're doing stupid things. Um, that would be probably my best AI assistant. Um, but that's not what I'm here to talk to you about today. Um, I've been doing just a ton of testing. Um, I've been nerding out with this piece of technology for the past six months or almost a year now because I think it's just endlessly fascinating to see what it can do. Um, I'm a, uh, a learning designer uh, with the digital assessment team um, and I've been playing around with the idea that by including uh, or, or reframing our questions uh, and our assessments to include specific types of critical thinking, we can in some way, make it AI proof. Um, and so I wanted to talk to you today a little bit about that. But um, so uh, part of what I've got here is a little bit of a workshop, a little bit interactive. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you exactly what it is um, that we're going to get through in the next uh, bit. But I wanted to start off with um, uh, a quick, quick bit of engagement for you guys. So in the chat, I would like to ask you, which do you think, which do you disagree with the most here? So number one, I am an artist because I used AI to make this image. Two, I am a chef because I used the McDonald's custom menu ordering system. Three, I'm a singer because I used a karaoke machine. Or four, I am a lawyer because I defended myself in court. 
So put a number in the chat. Which one do you think is is the least true? Oh, so we've got quite a range there. Lots of twos there. So would anyone like to um say why they thought two was um the furthest away from the truth? Chefs need to cook. <laughs> I guess that's a pretty strong argument because you're still singing if you're use, despite using a karaoke machine. Ordering food doesn't make the food. <laughs> yeah. Does that apply to the first one then? I I know of a whole heap of conceptual artists who conceive of ideas and then get other people or machines or tools to make those um, those objects or artworks. So we're dealing with um, some conceptual uh, fogginess here. Artists use tech tools so it can come down to the Gen AI makes another art making tool or the prompts are. Okay, so yeah, so the, the issue, there's an issue here about what exactly it is that we're talking about. So um, I want to do just another quick exercise for you, um, but I don't want you to write anything just yet. I want you to think about the question of what makes someone an artist. And I want you all to like, think about this just on your own. Um, and in 60 seconds, write something down in, um, in the chat. So just what your thoughts are here in two to three sentences, but don't write anything until I say go. So I'll just have you do nothing for 60 seconds. So there's creativity, originality, imagination, soul, a disposition for creativity. Karen, I, I'm not sure I know what blue poles is. That's an outrageous thing to say, Luke. We'll fix you later. Okay. It's a famous artwork. Ah. Well, now I'm just going to sit and feel bad for my uh, troglodyte status. Passion. All right. So I did this question with... Ooh. Using insights from different sources. Jackson Pollock, Passion. These are great. So I, I gave ChatGPT the same prompt as well, and I wanted to see what it thought um, from its own view on what some, makes someone an artist. Uh, <laughs> I mean, is that a great artwork? Stable diffusion, really? Um, provoke ideas and different perspectives. That's cool. Oh, I like that one, Jacinta. But yeah, yeah. Um, ChatGPT said, an artist is someone who expresses themselves through a chosen medium, communicating emotions, ideas, and perspectives in a way that resonate or challenge with others. It's not about technique, but more about intention and vision behind the, cre uh, behind the creation. Thus, being an artist is a blend of skill, insight, and the continuous pursuit of personal and universal truths. So that's a um, pretty good uh, response. So then I asked the follow-up question, well, can ChatGPT be an artist? Um, and it said... ChatGPT can produce creative outputs in response to prompts, mimicking artistic processes based on training data. However, it lacks personal experiences, emotions, intentions, which are fundamental to definitions of an artist. While it can facilitate or augment artistic endeavors, attributing the title of artist to ChatGPT blurs the distinction between tool and creator. Now, something that's worth Something that's worth noticing here 
is that it didn't really answer my question. I mean, it's it's implying no, but it's not taking a clear stance. It's hedging. It's hedging really badly. Now, the reason why I wanted to explore all this with you in the first place is because I wanted to show you what um, fundamentally a critical thinking exercise looks like because we used a clear cognitive verb, in this case, explain what an artist is, um, using the value of inquiry, clarity. So I wanted it to explain something and tell me specifically what it thought and, and be clear. Um, and critical thinking in this case was all of you putting down your clear ideas in the chat. It didn't specifically matter what the quality of the idea was. What mattered was how well you communicated it to me um, on this concept. Now, what I want to do here today is I want to talk a little bit about what it means to test AI for critical thinking, because when I started this, this um, testing process, it, it actually ballooned out to something massive because it was actually a lot more complicated than I, than I, than I gave it credit. So I need to, um, I want to go through a little bit of critical thinking stuff with you guys first. Um, but if I run through too much time, please let me know. I will speed up. Um, but yeah, I wanted to do a little bit of this stuff with you so that I can show you what the tests mean. So, um, you guys will probably have already done stuff like cognitive auditing with the critical thinking project, which is about picking the right verbs and skills for your task. Um, so uh, this is the diagram that the critical thinking project is, but basically whatever content we have, we can make it a critical thinking task by checking in. Um, oh. Uh, what the cognitive skill is that we use. So are we asking for analysis or interpretation or identification? Um, and then we measure it using values. So are we asking it to be clear um, or precise or coherent? And the type of person underneath it determines how well that occurs, the virtues, the habits, the dispositions. And that leads us back to the idea of inquiry, which is at the heart of critical thinking. And so that's um, all of critical thinking theory in a, a, a tight and slightly incoherent 30 seconds. Um, so rewriting for critical thinking, these questions takes a lot of effort and it's time consuming because you need to know exactly what it is that you wanted to test. I mean, the following question was a topic that was used in the Queensland secondary curriculum for a time in the 2010s. Um, Free will, discuss. That was it. So, could you rewrite this question? How would you um, want to? How do you conceptualize this question? What would you write if you had to do a cognitive audit here? So, what will what does free will infer? What is free will? explain the various interpretations of free will and just oh Lester that's an that's an awesome one it highlights the importance of context yes because all critical thinking is contextual it's it's kind of funny we can't really do it without having content in the first place reflect on your interpretation of free will explain it interpret how would you conceptualize it Give your interpretation. Yeah. So these all work um, in different ways and context matters. And this is something that we can do with literally every single question, depending on how much effort we want to put into it and whether or not we actually want to do critical thinking on every question, because that's generally not a great idea. It is exhausting. Oh, I like Kelly's. If you were God, would you have given people free will? Explain. That one's loaded with stuff. You're going to have to... Uh, uh, explain whether or not your God is evil in the first place. It definitely does have context. So just some quick possible variants just based on um, the verb. Oh, that's a good one. What would your life be like if you didn't have free will? <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it changes drastically um, depending on the verb. So it's important that we get the verb right. Um, so then we get down to the topic of measuring critical thinking. 
um, which is where my testing runs into um, conceptual issues because I really need to ex explain these things in a little bit of detail because there are a lot of different values of inquiry. And if you'll indulge me, I'll show you each what they mean in about one minute apiece. Does that sound okay? Um, so rather than going through these one by one on this page, I'll just do them one by one on each page individually to show you what they mean. So um, clarity means demonstrating clear thought processes and communication. So if it's unclear, the thought isn't fully visible, like, you know, a window covered with um, rain. If it's clear, the window is open and I can see exactly what it is that's in another person's brain. Um, and if it's opaque, the thought is deliberately hidden. We don't want to show what's in there, which is, you know, what you get with politicians and not, and stuff like that. But we definitely want, if we want a clear expression, we need to be measuring that. Um, accuracy and precision are things that are really important when it comes to knowing facts and figures, which might come up a lot and say medicine um, or any number of other things, unlike what I did in philosophy, which involves no accuracy and precision because we never ever deal with facts. Um, so, but what does that mean in context? Well, uh, we can have something that's low accuracy and low precision. So if it's like shooting a target, that would be shooting all over the place. We're not hitting anything very well. If we've got low accuracy but high precision, we're not hitting what we're supposed to be hitting, but we're very clearly hitting one spot the entire time. So an example of that might be like talking about the wrong topic, but getting that all right. Um, we've got high accuracy and low precision where you're more or less getting the center of it, but they're not really clustered in the way that they should be. So you're getting the details wrong, the gist of it's right. And then we've got high accuracy and high precision where you're hitting dead center and you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. So um, rather than, I'm not gonna go through a ton of this stuff, but just to give you some ideas of what this would look like as jobs, um, busking, low accuracy and low precision because they're generally bad at busking. Um, it doesn't really sound like the song that they're doing and they're not getting the lyrics right. <laughs> at least at the shopping centers I go to. Um, low accuracy and high precision. Um, if you're a tour guide at a boring place, I know personally that it's great to lie to people about how interesting your place is when you're at like a jail, because normally people will want to think that there's ghosts or something. So you, you tell the lie. Um, and, um, it's really precise in, you know, your storytelling there. Uh, public speaking, high accuracy, low precision. If you're actually a good person and you're doing it you don't want to get into a huge amount of detail but you do want to tell them the truth um and air traffic control you need to get it right and you need to be precisely right every time so uh depth and breadth i don't think i'll need to go into too much detail on this one but uh depth goes deeply onto one particular topic like going down to the bottom of the ocean to look at a, a sunken wreck Whereas breadth is more like snorkeling, where you're in the shallows seeing a lot of different things all over the place, but not spending a whole lot of time on any of them. Relevance, selecting and organizing ideas in a way that are related to one another. So I want to do the I want to show this one through an interactive part. So let's do a word association test, guys. I want you to say the first thing that comes into your mind. All right, ready? Morning. Tea, coffee, snooze, light. Cool. All right, I won't do too many of those, but... Uh, sorry, I, pro I produced way too much stuff here. Um, your ability to explain how morning was related to coffee will be the measure of relevance. Significance, on the other hand, is re recognizing the importance of ideas and their relative importance to one another. And this is really, really important for the testing that I did. So guys, what do you see here? Now, interesting is that a, a Rorschach ink block test is designed to give insight into what's going into a person's head. 
specifically, it'll give some information about what is important cognitively or emotionally to the person in that moment. So if you could say that and explain why that matters to you, why this is the thing that emerged to you, you would have done something that's significant. Um, coherence is about log logically putting together ideas uh, in a way that the communication is clear. So a coherent one might be um, giving some information about fluoride and an incoherent one might be uh, the ramblings of a person who is uh, a anti-fluoridation conspiracy theorist. Lastly, I wanted to talk about cogency, which is about get, making our thoughts convincing and persuasive in context. It's, it has to do with your thinking about what the audience will react to. So we've got one on the left here, which is a, a sober way of looking at fluoridation. But if I really wanted to be cogent with you guys right now, I would just give you a couple of dot points. Both of them are fine, but one of them is more cogent in, in different uh, in different contexts. So cogency hot take. Trump was more cogent than, in 2016 than Hillary. <laughs> so very like persuasive in context in the right time and place. Not so cogent anymore. Um, anyway, I hope that was a, a good little summary. It's really important to, to show all the testing here, though, um, that I did because my aim was to see how well it could perform on cognitive skills based on these values of inquiry. And initially, I did a test like evaluate and then marked it against a rubric, but it didn't help me discover what well went well in precise ways. So there are additional issues um, that the response might be distinct by just pressing regenerate. And so I abandoned that. Oh, I'm just going to skip that. Um, so my new process, what I did, um, I selected cognitive verb to, to assess. I inputted the question as closely to the possible question, always based on um, a test or similar to a test that's currently being done at UQ. Uh, I noted and evaluated the response against three different values of inquiry. Um, I constructed a new prompt to achieve a higher marker result. So this is the prompt engineering test. Um, and then I analyzed and evaluated for strengths and weaknesses, repetitions of text, awkward components, hallucinations. And then I did the same thing with the same cognitive verb in a different context using different values of inquiry. So it wasn't just in the math discipline, but also in the biology, not just philosophy, but also in medicine. Um, and then I did an overall analysis on this. Um, so I used chat GPT-3 for Google Bard and Bing AI. Uh, that's six cognitive skills in two different disciplines for each. Each test was done twice with the minimum and the maximum. Um, three values of inquiry for each test, marked on a high high pass and fail state simply because it was a lot to, to mark. Um, there's just a, an enormous amount of marking here. So um, how this would work, minimum prompting would be a question like this one. The bush holds different cultural significance for different people. Choose one piece of exhibition by an artist in Australia. What relationship does the desert, do, um, to the desert does this artwork portray in 500 words or less? And a prompt engineered test would look like this. Act as an art student. You feel a deep connection. You speak arente. Um, you are passionate about the cultural heritage of people. Um, here's the piece of art. Include a reflection on your kinship and the pride you have as an author. Gratitude towards your indigenous art that is meaningful your identity. Because I really wanted to nail the significance, relevance, and depth components of it. So, um, yeah, this was a lot of testing. Um, Sorry, guys, I'm just going to cut to it. Um, it's really not great at reflection. Um, so I found that without that internal state, it had to just guess what you were thinking. Um, and when it came to values, depth and significance were the worst because it didn't go into any depth generally and it didn't know what was important. So um, this is what it looks like just... Um, broadly speaking, and I know there's a lot going on here, but basically um, it's really good at being clear about things, especially when it comes to justifying and explaining, but really poor at reflecting on what's important to it in detail. So um, depth tended to be something that was mediocre at. Yeah, um, I went through and did all of these. This is like a, uh, a summary of all of those things together. Um, uh, so I have actually specific data on whether or not three and four did did differently, and it did vary from from verb to verb, um, and value to value. 
Um, but I have not found that there were um, significant differences most of the time. Um, but I could share with you those details later on. Um, so yeah, it didn't know what was important to it with minimum testing and um, reflection was something it consistently was not great at. Prompt engineering, uh, that presented a new problem because it did well at lots and lots of things. Um, the only things that uh, it consistently wasn't as good at was providing deep explanations. Um, and it's also worth noting that it still didn't know what was important to it. And so the student had to pick what was important to it. So um, summary of the results. Uh, this, I think, is probably the most useful thing. Um, that's my initial takeaway. And this is still subject to change. It might be different next year, um, which is that um, it's really good at providing clear and broad explanations, justifications, and interpretations. Um, but when it comes to reflections, it's often weak across the board. Um, evaluations, it doesn't know what's significant or cogent. Um, analyses were really interesting a lot of the time because it was actually really good at analysis in a lot of different ways, but it still didn't know what was important. So broad takeaways. Um, tasks that require broad explanations, coherent justifications, and accurate interpretations can be easily completed, but the hardest things for it to do were to have discerning judgment and recognize complexity. Um, I think I'm going to run out of time, so are there any questions about this so far? Um, I would welcome you um, if you have any questions to um, practice it using, uh, well, I've set up this Padlet to share questions or to put in a specific cognitive verb on the idea of making art with AI and sharing the response here. Um, uh, but there's there's a lot going on here in this and um, I appreciate the chance to to talk about the the research and testing that I've been doing on this because it is really fascinating and there is so much going on here uh, with what it can do and what it can't do. But I think it's it's something that's useful and practical for everyone to know right now that because AI doesn't know what's important, um, then that's a really important vector for our development of questioning and assessment going forward um, because we have to tell it and it's a student who is not critically thinking won't tell it. But it also raises the question um, then of if they're able to engineer a prompt this sophisticated where they are having an unambiguous statement, uh, where they're understanding uh, what's at stake in the assessment, where they understand the material, where they know where to draw things from, and they create this prompt, then aren't they critically thinking in the first place? They're just coming about it in a really weird way. Food for thought. Anyway, thank you for your, your time and indulgence, everyone. Um, but I think that's all about for me today. Thanks, Luke. We appreciate the insights and the work that you're doing. Um, Ali, are you ready to go? Sure am. Can so I invite you to... Up. Share screen and going. Um, yes. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, Luke, amazing presentation. Uh, really, really liked uh, what you're doing there. I think um, this presentation might, I don't know if it'll add, but it'll, it'll provide some good uh, maybe contrasts to, to yours. Uh, what I want to talk about today is how I've been using AI to assist in prompting critical reflection in work integrated learning. Um, so I'm uh, the course coordinator for a lot of the work integrated learning placement courses at the School of HMNS, Human Movement and Nutrition Sciences. Um, and one of the largest aspects, or one of the most critical assessment pieces that we provide students is critical reflection. Um, so jumping straight into it, in one of the courses, students have to complete 180 hours of clinical placement. Uh, students are assessed on eight competencies that the governing body, so Exercise and Sports Science Australia, has, has deemed as 
the minimum requirements a student needs to demonstrate to be able to practice in the industry. And I've, I've listed them here. So, you know, we've got from something quite broad as uh, professional conduct, uh, all the way to sort of the, the niche areas, of exercise assessment, prescription and delivery. Now, one of these assessments called the self-assessment is an assessment piece where students have to take each of these uh, eight attributes um, and 48 hours into placement, so about a week and a half, two weeks of full-time placement, uh, they need to provide a rating on um, where they where they feel each of those uh, professional attributes sits. And with each of those uh, ratings, they need to provide a justification uh, for why they've selected the, the, the rating that they've selected. So one of the examples I've provided here is client interaction and rapport. Uh, now, the, this is done on ePortfolio. The bullet points that follow are sort of key words that I've pulled from the literature and from sort of uh, placement manuals. So you've got stuff like practicing active listening, uh, practicing patient-centered care, demonstrating cultural competency and sensitivity. This is one that's becoming really important now and it's becoming more prevalent. You'll notice under client interaction that I've uh, I've taken a screenshot of uh, a, uh, an example of an advanced uh, rating. The example I'm going to give you in, in a second is uh, from two students who have given me permission to share this, but they both selected advanced on uh, the, the skills that they've demonstrated. Um, so I'll go to the next slide. This is uh, the example of two students who have provided a uh, a rationale or a reflection on why they believe they deserved an advanced rating on uh, their assessment. I'm going to move this annoying share screen uh, bubble. Example A, you can see that uh, very clearly this student has a, a really good level of critical thought. Um, you know, they've tried to, they've justified why, they've described, and they've given me some really good examples. Uh, in example B, the student also gave themselves an advanced uh, and they provided, I do my best to ensure I interact respectfully with clients. Now, one of my responsibilities as a clinical educator is to teach critical reflection throughout the placement journey. Now, uh, and so in doing that, when students submit an assessment, uh, when I get example A, it's really easy from my perspective as a clinical educator to go, okay, you know, dear student, I've read your work, you know, this is really interesting. Have you considered this? Where I sometimes struggle is in example B, you know, I do my best to ensure I interact respectfully with clients. Sometimes, it, especially with resource demands, it becomes quite tricky to provide uh, feedback for, for students. And so, you know, following the principles of equity, I wanna give my students the same level of feedback. So what I've been doing is using AI, specifically ChatGPT and the API interface, uh, and I've been training the AI to assist me in providing further prompts when I get interactions like this or comments, I should say, from students like this. Um, so if I go to the next slide, I will show you. So here is sort of, I've tried to summarize it all into, into a single slide, but at 48 hours of placement, a student will submit uh, their uh, appraisal. I interface with that on ePortfolio using the ChatGPT API. I've got RiffBot down the bottom there in orange, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, essentially what happens is in instances where I have a very small entry or an entry that I actually don't know how to provide feedback, um, instead of trying to on the spot think of where should I take my feedback, how should I give prompts uh, to you know for students to get them to think about what they have provided and the justification, I've sort of trained ChatGPT to uh, consider the assessment as a whole uh, and dissect and give me prompts. So in this example, uh, you know, ChatGPT was able to respond and go, okay, here are some three, here are three prompts for me as the clinical educator to consider to, to, to you know, uh, send to my students. So for example, it's got, can you recall a particular instance where you've chosen to communicate? Number two has got, you know, uh, in what ways do you demonstrate respect? And, you know, and number three is how do you handle disagreements? So I take these prompts and then I would send a, the, a a self-assessment to the student and their supervisor, and I'll give them further prompts. And I'll say, look, dear student, I've noticed you've given yourself an advanced rating and you said that you interact with clients well. Digging deeper, here's some things to consider. I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, these aspects. And then the student sometimes either submits a response via email or they would re-upload their original submission. And I think 
you know, this is an example of, uh, you know, what happens when you use AI to provide prompts and then ask students these series of questions. So I think the, the main takeaway here is students have the ability to critically analyze and provide, ref, you know, critical reflections and respond to prompts, but it's that base level of understanding, I guess, the task and the, the, the depth. So this is a good example of how a student was able to take my prompts uh, and then provide a response that is more, uh, you know, in par with the response that we received um, from the first student. So if I go back uh, a couple of slides, you can see that, you know, with further prompting, um, based with, you know, assistance with the, with, with the AI, I've been able to get the student to a level that I think is more respectable uh, in terms of, you know, where they should be at in their capstone units. Um, that's pretty much it for me. It's, you know, I wanted to use this opportunity to show sort of the other side. Instead of it being how students are using AI, it's how as a as a under-resourced, you know, academic, I am using AI to assist me because, uh, you know, when I get these submissions, the first things I do is I hold my temple and I go, oh my God, okay, I respectfully interact with clients. I don't know how to assist or provide comments. So I've been really using AI to uh, you know, fill in those gaps for me and and assist me uh, in that area. Pretty succinct. Um, happy to answer any questions or you know provide any more insight. Thanks, Ellie. That's a fantastic example. Uh, there's a question in chat from Kelly around how do you talk to or do you talk to your students around how you're using uh, generative AI? To give feedback yeah so my students do know i don't shy away and tell my students not to use ai or anything like you know if they use ai they have to obviously cite it and let me know um so the students do know uh they're, they're, they're under no uh pretense uh given the you know I, I coordinate for the courses here so the students are aware that there's some magic happening in the background to assist um i, I don't students don't have an issue with the use of ai i, I think for me, what I found, it's the relationship building. Uh, you know, the feedback helps, but once a student has that relationship with you and they know that what you're providing them is genuine and it's to help them grow, they sort of look past, you know, whether a computer is doing it or, or whether AI is, is assisting. Thanks. And there was uh, another question from Louise. Yeah. So I attended a workshop at UQ some time ago. It was a, a forum on, on AI. Uh, one of the academics who presented essentially showed how he's got one single chat essentially um, where he's been training the chat GPT to know more about his course and how he's delivering it. Essentially what I've done is over the last year is I've, I've you know, given chat GPT a list of, well, here's what I would consider to be critical reflections that have done really well. Here are poor, here are the components of the course. You know, here are the eight attributes. Here's what I want to um here is what I want you to look at. So when 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 I interface with the API and it detects, you know, I have I dress appropriately, full stop, it will go, okay, there's clearly an under 35 character uh, response. Here's some prompts to to increase sort of the the word count, so to speak, on the on the reflection. Uh, Shari, is that time to tell us about riff? Yes. So in my slides, I um in in orange or yellow. I had a Riffbot. So uh, Shari showed me Riffbot a couple of weeks ago and it's fantastic. If you've not used it or aren't aware of it, please have a look at it. It's wonderful. The only reason why um, uh, haven't, oh, Tanya showed, amazing. The only reason why I haven't really interfaced with it more, I do think it is more appropriate. Um, uh, I just, there's no API interface currently. Uh, you know, it's not currently free to use, or it is free to use, but we don't know how long that's going to be free to use. Um, so, uh, great, great resource, needs more exploration. Thank you. All right. Um, Ali, I think I'll move on. Thank you so much for your presentation well, you. today and the work that you're doing. Um, it's my pleasure to, oh, Karen. Oh, I just wanted to um, ask a quick question because there's somebody, I think the one in the chat was probably, uh, I mean, it's a kind of political. That's great, Ali. How can we know what's still okay and what's not okay in terms of university policy, which is probably a, a question for the room, not necessarily you personally, Ali. <laughs> I'm happy to ask ChatGPT what it thinks of the policy. <laughs> 
and maybe maybe that's a uh, that, that's a job for us to come back to anyway. Sorry, I just needed to kind of like maybe talk about that one, Dom. <laughs> if anybody else has got any thoughts. And I, I will throw a couple of things. Um, as you were talking, I think as Kelly hinted at, there's a moment of concern around giving putting students work into, you know, generative AI without their knowledge. But I think once it's, I think it's very different if they know versus don't know. And I think there's also a big difference between um, giving stuff back to students without a human in between, but checking and sense and sense checking on your behalf to go, well, this is, you know, a human making that decision and you as the course coordinator make that decision, I think is a very different thing to, you know, finishing that loop off with, all right, I put another bit of a system in that generates an email and sends it to students without my, you know, without you being in that loop. So I think some Definitely. of those things are, are really important questions around what is okay or not okay. Definitely. I think uh, maybe to provide some clarification, it's not all of all students work and it's not, so for example, in, in this slide, in that gray box, that this is what the AI has given me. This isn't copied and pasted or sent to students directly. It's more used as a prompt for me to prompt students. Instead of me having to sit there trying to think of how do I get the student to engage more in the content, I'm, I'm gaining assistance in that. It's sort of like using a moderator, to be honest, having someone give you a, a different insight. Um, because as I said, it's the ones that are really good at critical reflection at the stage that, uh, you know, you can sort of, you just know sort of how to prompt and give further feedback. It's that one sentence response that uh, can sometimes be time consuming and very challenging to, to sort of lift in terms of quality and, and, and skill. There's a range more questions and comments coming through. Um, I, will I will finish with just Kelly's one of, have you talked to students about doing some of this themselves? Not yet, not yet. I um, I think, you know, Luke's presentation really spoke heavily to that. I think we can do a better job in teaching critical reflections in the more foundational years of, of their scholarship. Um, but no, I, in terms of directly answering the question, I, I haven't. Um, uh, yeah. That's all. Thank you again so much, Ali. I'm going to hand over to Huang, um, and I look forward to hearing more about your work and how this keeps progressing. It was, it was really exciting and great to see. Thank you, Dom. Thank you, everyone. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Hong, and I am um, one of the e-learning advisors working at Italy e-learning teams. Uh, so in my part today, I am giving um, a brief um, introduction about Turnitin's generative AI writing indicator tool. Uh, I um, have been presenting about the tool um, a few months ago, so, but if you haven't heard about that today, I will uh, go briefly about the tool. Um, so if you are using Turnitin in, in your assessment, you will have the AI indicator available in uh, the student submission. And the tool is able to detect a generative AI content um, and which include chat GPT and uh, the level of confidence and accuracy that the tool claim to have is quite high, 98%, uh, but it also have the forms positive. Uh, and currently the tool is only viewable for the staff. And in order to use the tool effectively, uh, there are a few practical tips that I would like to share. Uh, first, when you're setting up your submission setting, uh, it's important to leave uh, the similarity report um, to exclude uh, not to exclude the bibliographic materials, quoted material, or small sources. Uh, if you leave this box unchecked, it will increase the similarity report because uh, a percentage because uh, Turnitin will have picking up all the text matching that in student submissions that it has matched with the Turnitin database. And when viewing the student submissions, um, we often start with the um, similarity report. So once you click on the student submissions, you will be able to see all the matching that is highlighted in student submissions. And um, as you can see that here in the references in a sample submissions, one reference is not matched. And when the academic go back and check the, um, the reference here, it is a hallucinated one because currently uh, chat GPT or generated AI is not 
are able to generate a true or a real reference yet and other references that uh, the chat gpt use or generative ai produce is uh, tend to be not the peer review material and uh, once you are looking at the similarity report, you can see the AI indicator is available here. And if you click on the indicator, uh, the report, the chat GPT, um, sorry, the uh, AI indicators will be open in another uh, tab. And you can um, click on that tab and look at uh, the report about the AI writing and if you need to go back to the similarity report, you can look at sign by sign here on the browser. So to sum up, when viewing the student submissions, uh, first we go to the similarity report and then uh, make sure that uh, there is in-text citation and uh, the reference list. Uh, and also um, pay attention to the peer whether the reference is the peer review paper or not. And again, the AI indicator should be used as the flag, but not for punit uh, punitive purpose. And um, currently, when you want to uh, talk about um, a student paperwork, we should not start with uh, pre talking about the uh, number in the AI indicator. And um, if you communicate this information with the tutor in your course, if they are in doubt, yeah, ask them to refer uh, the case to you so that you can further investigate student submission. Some improvement in the tool. Um, so um, in the future, users will be able to view the aggregated AI score across the missions over a period of time. Uh, so for example, we will be able to use the aggregated AI score um, that have been um, recorded for uh, the whole UQ, for example, for the semester. And currently the AI report has been um, developed to be downloadable and printable. So in the previous semester, we uh, couldn't print the report, but now the function has become available. And currently the references is not matched in the AI indicator. It is only matched in the similarity report, uh, but in the future, uh, the references will be matched in the AI um, report so that it can reduce the burden of manually checking each reference. And for the authenticate tool, the AI indicator will be available at the end of this year. Uh, so if you need to have a workshop organized for your teaching team, uh, please contact us so that we can uh, provide a custom workshop on the tool. Uh, I can see that there's a question in the chat. Okay, so are you talking about the similarity report or about the uh, Turnitin, uh, the false positive? Ashley? The AI report, yep. Um, so uh, yeah, we are aware that there's a false positive uh, and um, the recommendation that we have been communicating with the staff is that we use the marker instinct when reading the student's paper and um, we yeah, check the whole submission to see if student um, include any uh, false data or um, they indicate something very weird in their uh, submission. Um, and that can be the point where we can have some converse, conversation with the student. Uh, and if the student can prove that this is their uh, original work, uh, then we won't talk about the, um, the AI indicators in the student submission. So as I have mentioned, and also we have KK here in, um, in the audience, um, in his real cases, uh, he didn't communicate with the student about the score that is um, recorded in the student submission, but start by um, having a conversation with the student about the details uh, that the student included in their paper. Yeah. Thanks, Hong. Um... I think I'm going to wrap up there. If you yeah. have a moment, we really appreciate um, filling in the evaluation form that we've added there. There's a range of other resources on the Italy and eLearning website. Um, if you have any suggestions of people you would like to see at a future What's Working, please let us know. And I'd like to finish by saying thanks again to Ali, Hong, Anna, 
uh, Luke for your presentations today and for sharing with us. Um, again, it's been an interesting, exciting time exploring generative AI and looking forward to working with you further in this area. Thanks everyone.